Facial detection is fast becoming one of the biggest hotspots in artificial intelligence. It's been around for quite some time, but it's nevertheless becoming more and more important. We can use facial detection AI in Azure to find and analyze human faces in both images and videos. Face detection involves identifying regions of an image that contain a human face, typically by returning bounding box coordinates that form a rectangle around the face. Facial detection first involves scanning images or videos for objects, and this is very much like any other computer vision service in Azure. The difference here is that the object the service is looking for is a human face. Facial detection identifies regions within images or videos that are likely to contain a human face and then returns the suspected region along with bounding box coordinates. You can imagine a picture of someone and then their face encapsulated in a rectangle as if to say, hey, that's where the face is. And once a face has been detected in an image or a video, it can then be analyzed for extra information. And this includes things like age, emotions, sentiment, and more. The reason facial detection is becoming such a hot topic is because of ethics and responsible AI. As long as we can maintain people's privacy, the service is compelling and useful. However, if it's misused and people's privacy is invaded, we'll find ourselves having crossed a line of responsible AI. There are actually a few different resources that you can deploy in Azure to help you scan for and analyze faces. Each service has a specific purpose, of course, but it's possible to intermix them depending on what you're trying to do. The first service you can use is the Computer Vision Service. The Computer Vision Service can detect faces in images and can do some basic analysis, like age detection. However, it's more of a broad version of image analysis, so it doesn't contain in-depth features for facial detection. Meanwhile, the Video Indexer Service is a facial detection service, but designed primarily for capturing faces in video streams. And then we have the Face Service. This service includes pre-built models specifically designed for detecting and analyzing faces. This service offers the widest range of facial analysis. Alternatively, you can deploy Azure's Cognitive Service resource. Cognitive Services is a wrapper for all the various cognitive services in Azure. So this can include computer vision, natural language detection, and so on. The advantage of the Cognitive Services wrapper is that you can have a single key and endpoint to access all the various cognitive services rather than having to maintain multiple keys and endpoints for each individual service. Azure's Face Service has a number of very useful features. For example, the obvious feature is facial detection. The service can scan input and detect the various regions that contain a face. The service then returns bounding box information that states where the face can be found in the input. A cool feature of the face service is verification. Face verification is able to analyze two faces and determine the likelihood that they're the same person, along with a confidence score. A very similar feature to face verification is face similarity. That's not quite about it being the same person versus about being two pictures that look similar. The images certainly could be the same person, and all that would mean is that the similarity score would be much higher. For example, if you pass in images of twins, the similarity score would be high. But if you pass in Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito, the score would be very low. That'd be funny. They should make a movie about them being twins or something. Anyway, then comes the grouping feature. Grouping faces allows you to effectively categorize people into logical groups. For example, you can have a group of people as employees. Then you can scan images and see if that person belongs to one group or another. And finally, there's the ability to actually identify people. And that means taking an image of a person, or even an image of many people, and being able to actually identify who the person is in that photo based on a database of people. Facial detection is a simplistic concept, if not difficult to perform. The idea is that the face can be broken down into a series of landmarks. This includes size, color, shape of eyes, size and shape of ears, nose and mouth, hairline, eyebrows, skin color, and so on. Once a face has been broken down into these landmarks, each landmark coordinate can then be assessed to determine the information about the subject the face belongs to. What that means is that we can detect all sorts of information about the face. The result is that the face service can give us attributes along with each facial scan. For example, the person's head pose can be returned. Is this someone who cocks their head slightly? We discussed age being something that we can retrieve as well. And the age is based on a number of bits of information, but always returned as an estimate. 
I wonder what they'd say about Paul Rudd. Now, as humans, we are instinctively capable of detecting the emotions of other humans through the slightest facial expressions. Well, AI is coming along even in this category, too. In fact, the face service is capable of predicting the emotions of a subject along with the confidence level. All the possible emotions are scored and totaled up to a value of 1. So think of a pie chart. You can be surprised, fearful, and happy all at the same time if you're on a roller coaster, right? So you can map out the total amount of emotion that you have in each category on a pie chart. The API is also able to detect emotions like happiness, sadness, anger, contempt, disgust, surprise, fear, and yes, even neutrality. It might seem pretty obvious, but the face service can also provide attributes like facial hair or glasses. The attributes can even go so far as to distinguish between reading glasses and sunglasses. Oh, and the face service is quite capable of detecting your smile. Isn't that nice? There are lots of different smiles. You can have a cheerful smile, a contemptuous smile, a flirtatious smile, a wry smile, a playful smile, a sincere smile, a smug smile, a worried smile, a smirk, or even an arrogant smile. Whatever kind of smile you have, the service will return a value between 0 and 1 that indicates no smile all the way up to a clear smile. And of course, the API can also detect makeup but it can actually categorize that makeup into a set of Boolean values for everywhere that it can be applied. So you can see values for eye makeup and lip makeup. Now, not all facial pictures that the API is going to get are going to be top-notch. They can't all be winners. So another attribute the API can return is the overall blurriness of the face. And the value is given between 0 and 1 and has an informal rating of low, medium, or high. Another attribute the face service can find when analyzing an image is actually the exposure of the image. Just like blurriness, the photo itself can be problematic. The exposure value is given between 0 and 1 and has an informal rating of underexposed, good, or overexposed. And just like blurriness and exposure, the face service can detect if the image has any noise in it that could affect the quality of the results. The noise value is given again between 0 and 1 and has an informal rating of low, medium, and high. And finally, the face service can detect if there are any objects obstructing parts of the face. A common reason for that is hair hanging over someone's face, but it could just as easily be someone in a shadow, behind a post, or so on. These occlusions can be detected, and each part of the face that's obstructed is included in a Boolean output. Now, when you start using the face service, there are some limitations to consider. For example, only JPEGs, PNGs, GIFs, and BMP image formats are supported and the size of image files needs to be less than 4 megabytes. Now in pictures where faces are being detected, the faces themselves must be at least 36 by 36 pixels. Of course, there is a maximum too. The face must be less than 4096 by 4096 pixels. Faces outside of that range won't be found. And finally, faces that are at an extreme angle or blocked out by things like large glasses, hats, or hands may not be found either. Your best bet is always a straight-on, well-lit, unobstructed. In this demo, we're going to use the face service to analyze an image and detect the age of any faces it finds in that image. To do that, we're going to deploy the face service and then use the Notebooks feature in Azure ML Studio to run some code against the face service and analyze an image. After we run the code, we should see any faces in that image along with their ages estimated by the face service. Now before we get started, we need to make sure that we have the face resource installed in Azure, and then get a couple of key bits of information from there. So let's do that. First, we need to head over to the Azure portal. Now to add an Azure resource, let's click on the Create a Resource link in the hamburger menu in the top left corner. Now we need to search for face in the search field at the top of the screen. Now let's click on the face box and create. Good. Now you can select whichever subscription you want while you're creating this resource, but I'm going to leave mine as the default. But now we need to select a resource group. Now, obviously, you can create a resource group on the fly, or you can select an already existing one. In my case, I'm going to use the test resource group that I've already created called SBTest. Now, I'm going to leave the region as the default, but again, you can select whatever makes sense for you. 
Now let's give our resource a name. I'm going to call mine SBTest CS Face. And in case you're wondering, the CS stands for Cognitive Service, because that's what the face service really is. Now as for the pricing tier, well, since this is a demo, I'm going to just select the free option. And now I can finally click Review and Create. And then Create. Good. Now our face resource is ready to go. But in order to use it, we'll need a couple of bits of connection information. So let's navigate to the resource. We can do that by clicking on the Go To Resource button at the center of the screen. Good. Now the face service is just like most Azure resources, and that means that using it requires an endpoint and a key. Now we're going to need that connection information later, so let's get it now. We can get the connection information from the keys and endpoint blade. So let's click on that. Alright, so now this screen shows us two keys, an endpoint, and a location. What we need from this screen is one of the keys and the endpoint, so let's copy those values over to Notepad for later. Alright, so now we have a face resource and its connection information. Now let's actually go analyze some faces for ages. Now to do that, we need to head over to our ML Studio. And I've already got mine open in another tab, so I'm just going to switch over to that tab. Good. Now what we want to do here is use our fancy new face service and submit some faces to it for age analysis. And if all goes well, we'll see the age of each face that we submit. To do that, we need to execute some code. To do that, we need to head over to the Notebook section. Now before we go any further, this demo assumes that you've already configured a compute instance in ML Studio. If you haven't, you'll need to go and do that first. We don't need a particularly hefty compute instance, a simple D11 v2 VM will do the trick. Anyway, what we want to do now is download the Microsoft AI Fundamentals Git repository, as it has some libraries that we'll need for this demo. To do that, we're going to execute a git command to clone the sample locally. To do that, we need to first create a file so that we can execute the git command. So let's create a file by clicking on the Create New File button in the Notebooks toolbar. On the pop-up, let's give the file a name. In fact, we'll keep it simple and call it Git Commands. Then we'll set the file type to Notebook, and then click Create. Good. Now this opens up the new file automatically, and that's good because we want to issue a command. But before we can do that, we need to make sure that we've got our compute instance selected. You can do that by selecting your compute instance in the toolbar in the file. Mine's already selected, so I'm good to go. Alright, so what we want to do now is execute a git command that will clone a Microsoft sample into our local notebook. To do that, I'm going to paste the command into the rectangle selection in the middle of the screen. Now I'll provide that command in the doobly-doo so you can copy it from there. Good. Now we can execute the command by clicking on the play button in the left of the command. Below the command we can see the output, and once the command's been fully executed, we can click on the refresh button in the notebook toolbar and we'll see a new folder called AI Fundamentals. Perfect. Now what we want to do is create another new file, except this time we're going to put it inside the AI Fundamentals folder. To do that, click on the ellipsis button to the right of the AI Fundamentals folder, and then select the Create New File option. Good. Now let's give our file a name. Now I'm going to call mine Get H. Alright, now we'll set it as Notebook and then we'll click Create. Alright, so now we need to create some code blocks to execute. In order to use the face service, we need to install some modules on the compute instance, so the first code block will be about installing those modules. Now once again, I'll provide all the code you're about to see in the doobly-doo, so you can copy it from there. So here's the first code block. Now make sure you have the right compute selected, and then let's run the code block.
Good stuff. Now our modules are installed. The next thing we need to do is bring our connection details from the face service that we just installed. So let's create another code block by clicking on the plus symbol below and to the left of our module code block. Good. Now let's paste the connection information code in here. All right, now in order to connect to the face service, we need access to it. And you'll see that now we need to populate a couple of variables with our key and endpoint that we collected earlier. So let's populate the key variable with our key and the endpoint variable with our endpoint, and then we'll run the code block. Okay, so at this point we finally have the entire system prepared to actually analyze some faces for age. So let's create another code block so that we can do that. Now this code block will be for executing commands against the face service. So let's paste the command code in here. Now let's take a quick peek at what this code is doing. On line 17, you'll see that the code is executing a method called detect with stream. This method is used to detect faces in a given image. The image is defined on line 12. The method also accepts attributes that we want to collect about any faces that we detect. That information is found on line 16. In this case, you'll see that the only information that we want to collect about the detected faces is the age. So let's go ahead and execute the code block and see what it tells us. All right, so we see that the image that was given is of a woman in a grocery store taking a picture of a little girl. From the information at the top, the AI indicated that there was only one face detected. On the image itself, we see a box that was put around the woman's face and that her age was estimated at around 34. Cool. But let's try it with an image that has more than one face. Let's change the image on line 12 from store cam one JPEG to store cam 2jpg and then re-execute. Cool. This time, there are two faces found, one of the woman and now one of a man in the background. This time, thanks to a new angle, the AI thinks that she's around 36, and the man in the background is estimated at around 42. Okay, let's try it with one more image. Let's try it with an image that includes a child. Let's change the image on line 12 from store cam 2 to store cam 3. And re-execute. Awesome! This time the woman is once again estimated at about 36 years old. But now there's a girl in the background and the AI has estimated her age at around 9 years old. Now notice that it was able to do that even though the girl's face is a little blurry. Obviously if the picture of her was of better quality, then the AI would do a more accurate guess. Regardless, that's it. That's age detection using the face service. Great job. In this demo, we're going to use the video indexer service to process video. To do that, we're going to use the Notebooks feature in Azure ML Studio to upload a video to the online video indexer service so that it can analyze the video and give us some information about it. We'll analyze the output and I'll explain what's meant by each section. Now before we get started, we need to collect some information from Microsoft's online video indexer service. So let's open up our browser and head over to videoindexer.ai. Now if you've never logged into this service, then follow the directions to log in and sign up for an account. For this demo, we'll be using a trial account. Now like most services, in order to use the Video Indexer service, we need to have connection details. Specifically what we need is our account ID and then API details. So let's go gather that information and squirrel it away into Notepad because we'll need it later. First, let's start with the account ID. To get that, we need to click on the hamburger menu in the top left corner and select the Account Settings option. Good. Now on this screen we can see information about our account. 
we can also see the account ID. So let's copy that and put it into Notepad for later. Next, we need some API details. For that, we need to go to the Video Indexer API portal. So in another browser tab, let's head over to api-portal.videoindexer.ai. Now, if you're not already signed in, do so now by clicking on the Sign In button in the top right of the screen. Then click on the Products tab at the top of the screen. Then let's click on the Authorization product. And then click on Product Authorization Subscription. Now on this screen, we see a couple of subscription keys. To talk to the API, we need one of those keys. So let's go ahead and copy one of the keys to Notepad. Now what we want to do next is interact with the Video Indexer API using a bit of Python code. The easiest way for us to do that is to use the Notebooks feature in Azure ML Studio. So let's head over to ML Studio. Now I've already got it open in another tab, so I'll just click on that tab. And now let's head over to the Notebooks section. Now what we want to do is run some code to upload a video to the Video Indexer, and then see some output from the video processing. To do that, we're going to execute a bit of Python code. So let's start by creating a file so that we can execute that code. So let's click on the Create New File button in the Notebooks toolbar. Good. Now the pop-up is asking us for a name for the file. So let's call it something that represents what we're going to do here. I'm going to call my file Video Analysis. And then we'll set the file type to Notebook and click Create. Awesome! So now we need to create some code blocks to execute. Now in order to send commands to the Video Indexer service, we need to install some modules on the Compute instance. So the first code block will be about installing those modules. Now don't worry, I'll provide all the code you're about to see in the doobly-doo so you can just copy it from there. Anyway, let's paste the first code block. Now make sure you have the right compute selected, and then let's run the code block. Good stuff! Now our modules are installed. Now the next thing we need to do is bring our connection details from the video indexer service that we collected earlier. So let's create another code block by clicking on the plus symbol below and to the left of our module code block. Now let's paste the connection information code into here. Now in order to connect to the Video Indexer service, we need access to it. You'll see that we now need to populate a couple of variables with our account ID and the API key that we collected earlier. So let's populate the account ID variable with our account ID and the API key variable with our API key. Now while we do that, notice that my location variable is set to trial. If your video indexer service is not a trial instance, you'll need to put your region information into that variable. Anyway, let's copy our values and then run the code block. Okay, so at this point, we finally have the entire system prepared to actually analyze video. But what video do we want to analyze? Well, let's take a real quick peek at what we're going to look at. The video we're going to analyze is actually an online sample from Microsoft, so we'll reference it by our URL in our next code block. But I've downloaded it so that you can look at what we're dealing with. So I'm going to play the video. Here's a few shots of the waves in Coronado Beach in San Diego, California. Now in that video, we hear some voices, we see some waves on a beach, and we hear sounds of the water. So let's go back to the ML Studio and finally create that code block that we'll use to analyze the code. 
Now this code block will be used for executing commands against a video indexer service. So let's paste the command code in here. Now let's take a quick peek at what this code is doing. On line 18, you'll see that this code is posting a video. The video is defined on line 8. The call also accepts attributes about what we want to collect, but we're leaving that empty so that we can get back all the information. So let's go ahead and execute the code block and see what it tells us. All right, so the code executed, got an access token, and then uploaded the video. The code has also given us a video ID. Now that's important. You see, what this code has done is uploaded a video for processing, gave us an ID for that uploaded video, and now it's asking us to make a different request to get information about that processed video. The ID is our link to do that. Now that brings us to one final code block. So let's create one more code block and we'll use it to actually collect information about the video. Now this code block will send the video ID to another endpoint in the Video Indexer API and retrieve information about the processed video. So let's paste that code. And now let's execute this code block and see what it tells us. Now in this case, the video has not yet finished processing. So let's wait a second and try it again. Perfect. Now notice that the output is some really gross JSON. It's very hard to read here, so let's copy it and take it to an online JSON formatter so that we can inspect it more clearly. Excellent. Now the information we need is stored in the Summarized Insights section, so let's scroll down to that and take a peek. Notice all the information in this section. We can see information on duration, any faces it found, its sentiment, which is neutral, emotions, audio effects, and labels. Notice how the labels correctly show that the video is outside, landscape, a beach, has water, was on the shore, sky, and so on. In fact, the entire output is extremely verbose. You can get a lot of information from Video Indexer. However, it's worth noting that some of the information you collect requires you to first train a model. For example, collecting faces from the video would mean that you need to train the indexer to be able to find certain faces. Regardless, that's it. That's video analysis using the Video Indexer service. Great job! In this demo, we're going to use the face service to detect, recognize, and analyze faces for sentiment. To do that, we're going to use our previously deployed face service and then run through a sample for Microsoft using the Notebooks feature in Azure ML Studio. Now, before we can get started, we need to make sure that we have the necessary connection information from our face service that we installed in a previous demo. So let's do that. First, we need to head over to the Azure portal. Now I've already got the face resource I deployed open, so you'll have to search for yours. To connect to the face service, we'll need to get a key and an endpoint, and we can find those in the keys and endpoints blade. So let's click on that. All right, so now this screen shows us two keys, an endpoint, and a location. What we need from this screen is one of the keys and the endpoint. So let's copy those values to Notepad for later. So now that we have the connection information to our face service, let's actually go analyze some faces. To do that, we need to head over to our ML Studio. Now I've already got mine open in another tab, so I'm just going to switch over to that tab. Good. Now what we want to do here is to use our fancy new face service and submit some faces to it for analysis. If all goes well, we'll see information about each face that we submit. To do that, we need to execute some code. And to do that, we need to head over to the Notebook section. Good. Now in a previous demo, we downloaded Microsoft's AI Fundamentals Git repository. What we want to do here is run through one of the samples so that we can submit some pictures to our face service for analysis. 
So let's expand the AI Fundamentals folder. Good. Now we can see in this folder that there are all kinds of different activities that you can do in here. In our case, we're interested in facial analysis. So let's click on the 01D face analysis file. Now the Microsoft sample on facial analysis actually includes a lot of useful information and guidance on how to perform this task. It's definitely worth reading over and reviewing it for extra details on facial analysis. But in the interest of time, I'm going to run through this relatively quickly and then explain what we're doing. So let's scroll down to the first code block. This code block is asking us for information about our deployed face resource. In order for this notebook sample to connect to our face resource, we need to give it our connection details. So let's go ahead and copy the key to the key variable and the endpoint to the endpoint variable. And then we can run this code block by clicking on the play button to the left of the code. Now the next thing this notebook needs is modules to be installed on the compute instance in order to be able to run Azure's face service. So let's scroll down to the next code block and run the installation command. Okay, so at this point we have the entire system prepared to analyze images for faces. Finally, now let's scroll down to the next code block. Now this code block executes a function called detect with stream. This function takes in an image from line 11 and simply analyzes it to see if it can find any faces. So let's run this code and see what it tells us. Cool. The picture shows us a woman in a grocery store with two kids and a man in the background. The only faces that we can see are the woman's face and the man's face and the face service has found them too. Both faces have a bounding box wrapped around them. But what would you do with these faces? Well, it's worth noting that there's information that comes along with each face that can help us decide what to do with them or what code we might want to run. For example, each face that's returned from these calls is given a unique identifier. So if we scroll down to the next code block and execute it, you'll see what I'm talking about. In this example, we see the same woman, but with a child. Now, both faces once again have a bounding box around them, but this time we also see the unique ID associated to each face. Okay, now that's the ID, but what else can we get from the facial analysis call? Well, as we saw from a previous demo, we're also able to get age information, but we can also get information about a person's emotions too. To illustrate, let's scroll down to the next code block and execute it. This time, we see the same woman taking a picture of the little girl. This time, the face service has estimated the woman's age to be about 34, but it's also given us details on her emotions. In this case, we see that she's smiling, so we can assume she's happy, and the AI has assumed the same. Now, the various ratings about her emotions show that she's not angry, disgusted, sad, or surprised, but actually happy. Now, let's keep going. What else can we do? Well, we can use the face service to recognize similar faces with multiple images. In our previous code blocks, we've seen the same woman over and over again. We can use the face service to recognize the same face in multiple images. To see that in action, let's scroll down to the next code block. Now, this code block executes a method called FindSimilar on line 14. Now this method takes in multiple images and then compares them to see if there are faces that appear to be in both images, or at least are similar. So let's execute it and see what it does. Perfect. Now in the image on the left, we see a bounding box around faces that were found. And we see the same thing in the image on the right. But we also see that the woman's face has been marked as a match. All right. Now let's do one more thing. The face service can also be used to recognize faces. And that means that we can not only find faces in images, 
but we can also identify who the faces belong to. However, in order to do that, we have to train the service to identify certain faces. So let's quickly do that and see it in action. If we scroll down to the next code block, we're going to create a group of people that we call employees. We can create all kinds of different groups. The groups just give us a logical grouping of people, like saying players, coaches, and officials are all logical groups. Anyways, let's create the group. Now in the next code block, we're feeding in multiple images into that group for a single person that we're calling Wendell. So let's execute that so that we can upload the images. Then, in the next code block, we're going to train the model so that it can understand how to identify Wendell. So let's execute the training. And that brings us to the final code block. In this code block, we're executing a method called identify on line 9. Now we pass in an image and ask the model to see if it recognizes any people in that image. So let's run the code block and see what happens. Perfect! Look at that! It found Wendell. And that's the facial analysis and recognition service in a nutshell. Great job! One of the most used features of Azure's computer vision service is optical character recognition, or OCR. But what is OCR? Well, put simply, OCR is a feature that allows you to extract text from images. For example, with OCR, you can extract printed text from images and convert it to computer text. Once you have a digital version of that text, you can do whatever you want. So imagine you want to scan online brochures or websites and extract sales information from images so you could inform users of new and current sales at certain stores. You could use OCR to do that. OCR can retrieve text from just about any image, in fact. This includes printed pages, photographs, scanned documents, receipts, invoices, business cards, and so on. If the image has text, OCR should be able to retrieve it. For example, in a city that I used to live in, they really, really love photo radar. Photo radar is effectively just a hidden camera that takes pictures of speeding cars as they pass by. With OCR, the vehicle's number plate can be read and a fine sent to the vehicle's owner. But OCR isn't just about extracting text from images. With advanced OCR techniques, you can also validate grammar, detect sentences, determine the proper spelling of words against dictionaries, and so on. So just how does OCR work? Well, OCR is like most machine learning algorithms. Its model is built specifically for recognizing and determining text. The first thing OCR does is clean up the document or image. OCR will actually take multiple passes over the image to make sure that the image is as clean as possible so that the text has a better chance of being detected. So how can we know that any one portion of the image contains text? Well, each potential symbol is run through a text recognition algorithm that is specifically intended to identify glyphs. A scribble is not necessarily a glyph, but sometimes it is. Each found potential glyph is then compared to a database of known characters. If there is a match, then the glyph is a character. If there isn't a match, then the glyph is discarded. And once the characters are determined, words can be put together based on the character placement and likelihood of being the same word. Then each potential word is compared to various dictionaries of known words. And finally, just as characters are put together to create words, words are put together to create sentences. Then any identified sentences can be checked to see if they make sense grammatically. Sometimes they don't, and we're really just looking at a collection of words, not whole sentences. For example, an address is not really a sentence. Okay, so that's what OCR is and how OCR works, but what are some real-world use cases for OCR? Well, there are lots of use cases, really. I mentioned scanning websites for sales or the photo radar situation from my past, and there's lots of different ways OCR can be implemented. For example, imagine being a salesperson collecting contact information from potential clients. While this is moving to be more digital, the majority of people that interact with salespeople will provide business cards. Ideally, that contact information is uploaded to a central database like Salesforce or Microsoft Dynamics. With OCR, business cards can be scanned for information like business names, addresses, and the people's names. Then that information can be uploaded to the customer repository for processing. 
One of the most compelling uses for OCR is actually the import and conversion of printed text, like documents. Probably the most interesting use case for that is case law. Law clerks, interns, or summer associates that spend the bulk of their time looking through case law may actually be completely replaced by OCR-based AI. With all of that documentation digitized and appropriate AI-based searching enabled, people would simply be unable to compete with the accuracy, efficiency, and speed of AI. And finally, one more example of OCR use is self-driving cars. Self-driving cars need to be able to understand the world around them, and among many other things, that includes using OCR to identify street signs. When using OCR from Azure, one of the ways that you can do that is via what's called the OCR API. The OCR API can scan images for text and return a certain amount of information. And one thing that's important to understand is that the OCR API is best used when there's only a small amount of text in the image. If you have a large amount of text, then the read API is probably better. And we'll talk about that later in the course. The OCR API's main purpose, of course, is to extract text from images. So imagine an image from a store that shows the name of the store, some products that are on sale, the sale information itself, and then maybe operating hours. The OCR API can extract that information for you. Now the biggest advantage of the OCR API is that it can provide immediate results. With the OCR API, you can send in an image and it will return you the results right away. In other words, the OCR API does not implement the broker pattern, but rather returns you the results in the response to your request. And finally, one more feature of the OCR API is that it can actually recognize text in multiple languages. So if you're looking at an image that has English and Japanese, which is fairly common in Japan, then both bits of text can be extracted by the OCR API. When the OCR API scans an image, it actually returns more than just the identified text. It's still a fairly simple API, but you nevertheless get some additional information that might be useful. For example, whenever text is found in the image, the OCR API will identify the regions where the text was found by providing bounding box coordinates. This is a little bit like the other computer vision services. Now for each identified region, the lines of text within that region are returned. So it's not just a block of text found in the image, it's a bunch of regions, and then each region has text. This provides a mechanism for identifying key text. For example, imagine a business card. One region would be the business name, another region would be the address, and still another region would be the person's name. So in that sense, regions are actually logical groupings of found words. And lastly, speaking of words, individual words are actually identified by the OCR API in each line of the returned text. So you can look at the OCR API responses and see each individual detected word. In this demo, we're going to use the computer vision service to read text from images using optical character recognition, or OCR. To do that, we're going to deploy the computer vision service and then use the Notebooks feature in Azure ML Studio to run through a Microsoft sample exercise. As we run the sample, we'll talk about what we're seeing. Now before we get started, we need to make sure that we have the computer vision resource installed in Azure, and then get a couple of bits of key information from there. OCR is handled by Azure's Computer Vision Service, so let's deploy it. To do that, we need to head over to the Azure portal. Now to add an Azure resource, let's click on the Create a Resource link in the hamburger menu in the top left corner. Now we need to search for Computer Vision. Now let's click on the Computer Vision box and create. Good. Now as you create this, you can select whichever subscription you want. I'm going to leave mine as the default. But now we need to select a resource group. And obviously you can create a resource group on the fly if you want, or select an already existing one. In my case, I'm going to use my test SB test resource group. Now I'm going to leave the region as the default, but again, you can select whatever makes sense for you. Now let's give our resource a name. I'm going to call mine SB Test CS Comp V. And once again, the CS stands for Cognitive Service, which is what this resource really is. Now as for the pricing tier, 
Well, since this is a demo, I'm just going to select the free option. And now I can finally click Create. Good. Now our computer vision resource is ready to go. But we'll need a couple of bits of connection information from there. So let's go into the resource to get them. We can do that by clicking on the Go To Resource button at the center of the screen. Good. Now like most Azure resources, in order to use the resource, we need to have an endpoint and a key. And we're going to need that later, so let's get that information now. We can get those bits of information from the Keys and Endpoints blade, so let's click on that. Alright, so now this screen shows us two keys, an endpoint, and a location. And what we need from this screen is one of the keys and the endpoint. So let's copy those values into Notepad for later. All right, so now we have a computer vision resource and the connection information. Now let's actually read some text from images. Now to do that, we need to head over to our ML Studio. And I've already got mine open in another tab, so I'm just gonna switch over to that tab. Good. Now what we wanna do here is run through a Microsoft sample that already includes some information for analysis with OCR. We wanna take those images and push them through our fancy new computer vision resource and have it pump out the text that it reads from those images. To run the Microsoft sample, we need to head over to the Notebooks section. Now before we get started, this demo assumes that you've already run through our previous demos in this course, so you've already cloned the Microsoft AI Fundamentals Git repository locally, but if you haven't, you'll need to go back and do that. Anyway, let's expand the AI Fundamentals folder. Now we can see in this folder that there's all kinds of different activities that you can do in here, but in our case, we're interested in reading text from images using OCR. So let's click on the 01E optical character recognition file. As always, the Microsoft sample on reading text with OCR includes lots of useful information and guidance. I definitely recommend reading over the information in this file. But once again, in the interest of time, I'm going to run through this relatively quickly and then explain what's happening. So let's scroll down to the first code block. So obviously what we want to do here is read text from images, but in order to do that, the notebook sample needs access to a computer vision resource to run images through. You'll see that we now need to populate a couple of variables with our key and endpoint that we collected earlier. So let's populate the key variable with our key and the endpoint variable with our endpoint, and then we'll run the code block. Excellent. Now the next thing the notebook needs is modules to be installed on the compute instance in order to be able to run Azure's computer vision service. So let's scroll down to the next code block and run the installation command. Okay, so at this point we finally have the entire system prepared to actually do some image analysis. So let's quickly recap what we're trying to do here. In this demo, we're trying to read text from an image. So try to imagine a picture that has text overlaid on top of it. Usually this includes advertisements or even things like baseball cards. Using OCR, we can scan images like that and extract the text into a digital form. Once we have the text, then we can apply whatever logic we need. So let's scroll down to the next code block. This code block executes a piece of code against the OCR API called Recognize Printed Text in Stream. As you can probably guess from the name, the purpose of this code is to accept an image, in this case the image from line 12, and then read all of the text that it finds in that image. That code can also provide a confidence level for its description. In this case, we're going to pass in a sample image of a grocery store advertisement. That image includes some text that names the store, has a tagline, and indicates when it's open. So let's go ahead and execute the code block and see what it tells us.
Alright, so if we scroll down to the bottom of the output, we can see the sample image that was passed to the OCR API for processing. Now, as I said, the picture is that of a woman in a grocery store stocking produce. Then directly on the image is some text that names the store, Northwind Traders, has a tagline, fresh produce, friendly service, and indicates when it's open, seven days a week. Meanwhile, above the image is the output from the OCR API. The OCR API scanned the image and extracted the text. In fact, if we look at the output, it matches exactly what the image contains, including the punctuation. Now that's pretty good. But OCR isn't just about reading text from the image. It can provide some other details too. One of the bits of information it can provide is the coordinates about where the text is in the image. In fact, we can see that in action if we scroll down to the next code block. This code block executes the exact same method against the OCR API as the previous code block did, but this time it uses the returned coordinate information to draw bounding boxes around the text that it finds. So let's run it and see what we get. Alright, so we see the same image as before, but this time we can see that we've drawn some bounding boxes around each of the individual lines of text that were found in the image. Pretty cool. So now we've seen the OCR API in action. We can read text from images and we can use some of the returned information to take additional action, like drawing bounding boxes. In our next demo, we'll pass in real life images. In our last demo, we used the Computer Vision Services OCR API to scan text from images. In this demo, we're going to use the Computer Vision Services Read API to read text from real life images. To do that, we're going to piggyback off our previous demo to continue running through a Microsoft sample exercise in Azure ML Studio. But we'll also upload a few additional images to see the service in action. Now before we get started, this demo assumes that you've run the previous demo and already have the necessary connection details for your deployed computer vision service. So what we want to do is keep running the same Microsoft sample from that demo. So to do that, we need to head over to the Azure ML Studio in our browser. Good. Now I've already got the Microsoft sample from our previous demo open in the notebook section in the ML Studio. If you don't, you'll need to head over to the Notebook section and open the 01E Optical Character Recognition file, and then make sure that you've provided your computer vision connection details in the first code block and executed that code block, of course. Okay, so what we did in our previous demo is that we passed in an image of a grocery store advertisement into the OCR API so that the text could be pulled from that image. In that example, and in fact in most cases like that, the text was very clear because it's put on an easy to read background and it's computer printed. What we want to do in this demo is use the read API to pass in some real life text and see if the OCR can pull that text out. So let's do that. Now just a quick word on the OCR and the read APIs. The OCR API is very good for pulling text out of image. However, the read API is preferable if you have a lot of text or if the text is not as well formed as printed text, in other words, handwritten. Anyway, let's scroll down to the very last code block in this sample. Now this code block executes a method against the read API called read in stream. Now this method accepts an image as an input, and the image is defined on line 11. In this sample, we're passing the API a handwritten shopping list on a sticky note. So let's execute the code block and see what it does. Cool! So in this case, we see a nice handwritten grocery list. And we, as humans, can read the note. It says, non-fat milk, bread, and eggs. And it's also titled, shopping list. Now if we look at the text above the image, we can see that OCR has pulled out the correct text. Very cool. But look at that note. It's crisp and clear. What about some other handwritten text? Well to do that we need to upload a few images, so let's do that. Now don't worry, I'll provide these images in the doobly-doo so that you can use them too. 
Anyway, we're going to upload these images to the same location as Microsoft's samples. So to do that, we need to expand the Data folder. And click on the Ellipses button next to the OCR folder and then select Upload Files. Good, now let's browse for our test images and upload them all. Perfect, now let's use our uploaded images. To do that, let's scroll up to line 11 in our code block. In this line, we can see that it's referencing note.jpg. So let's change that to test image onejpg Test underscore image underscore one.jpg. Good. Now let's execute this code block. Cool. So now we can see that we're using a different image. In this image is a small poem on a lined, coiled notebook, along with a flower and a name. It's a little darker than Microsoft's sample, and it's even a little blurrier. But we can tell from the text above the image that OCR was able to pull out the text exactly. Now let's try out our next image. Let's scroll back up to line 11 and change the image to test underscore image underscore 2.jpg. and execute that. Awesome! This time we see a nice little love letter. The letter is a bit crooked and the text is a bit more cursive. More importantly, notice that the text is a mixture of uppercase and lowercase letters. And if we look at the text that OCR pulled out, we can see once again that the text is correct, but we also see that the text is the correct upper or lower case letters. Now let's try something a little different. Now I used to live in a city that really, really loves photo radar. Photo radar is used to catch speeders. Now as a speeding car travels past a hidden camera, a photo is taken of their number plate. Then using OCR, the plate is read and a fine is mailed out to the owner of the vehicle. So let's see if we can do the same thing. Now let's go back up to line 11 and change the image to test underscore image underscore 3 dot jpeg. And now let's run the sample once more. Perfect! Now as you can see, the image is that of a Prius and the plate is visible. Of course, we have to stretch our imagination a little bit about a Prius being caught speeding, but we'll manage. Anyway, if we look at the captured text, we can see that the plate number has been successfully captured. And that's awesome. Now we've seen OCR's ability to pull printed text out of images, as well as being to pull text out of real-life images. In our next demo, we'll look at using the Read API to read printed documents. In our last couple of demos, we used the Computer Vision Services OCR and Read APIs to scan text from images. In this demo, we're going to use the Computer Vision Services Read API to read text from images that contain documents. To do that, we're going to piggyback off our previous demos to continue running through a Microsoft sample exercise in Azure ML Studio. But we'll also upload a few additional images to see the service in action. Now before we get started, this demo assumes that you've run the previous demos and already have the necessary connection details for your deployed computer vision service. So what we want to do here is keep running the same Microsoft sample from those demos. To do that, we need to head over to the Azure ML Studio in our browser. Good. Now I've already got my Microsoft sample from our previous demo open in the Notebooks section of ML Studio, but if you don't, you'll need to head over to the Notebook section under the 01E Optical Character Recognition file, and then make sure that you've provided your computer vision connection details in the first code block and executed that code block. Okay, so what we did in the previous demos is that we passed in an image of a grocery store advertisement into the OCR API so that the text could be pulled from that image. In that example, and in fact in most cases like that, the text was very clear because it's put on an easy-to-read background and it's computer printed. 
Then in our next demo, we used the read API to pass in some real life images, like handwritten notes, and pulled text out of them. What we want to do in this demo is keep using the read API again to pass in some scanned documents and see if OCR can pull that text out. So let's do that. Now just a quick reminder on the OCR and read APIs. The OCR API is very good for pulling text out of images. However, the read API is preferable if you have a lot of text or if the text is not as well formed as printed text, in other words, handwritten. So in this demo, we'll be pulling text out of scanned documents, and so that means we're going to be using the read API. Anyway, let's scroll down to the first code block in the use read API section. Now this code block executes a method against a read API called read in stream. Now this method accepts an image as an input, and the image is defined on line 11. In this sample, we're passing the API an image of a scanned letter. The letter is from a customer that's giving some positive feedback to a fictional grocery store about their service. The letter is typed and monospaced, so it's very clear and legible. Now at the very bottom of the image, the customer has signed their name. Anyway, let's execute this code block and see what it does. Cool. So now we can see the image that was passed in. And as I said, it's very clear and easy to read. And at the bottom, the customer's name is signed. Meanwhile, above the image, we can see that OCR has successfully pulled out all the text, including the signed name. This is important because it shows that OCR can pull out printed and handwritten text at the same time. Very cool. But what about text that isn't monospaced? Well, let's find out. To do that, we need to first upload a couple of images. So let's do that. Now don't worry, I'll provide these images in the doobly-doo so that you can use them too. Anyway, we're going to upload these images in the same location as Microsoft's sample images. To do that, we need to expand the data folder, and then click on the ellipsis button on the OCR folder, and select Upload Files. Good. Now we'll browse for our files and select all of them. Perfect. Now let's use our uploaded images. To do that, we need to scroll up to line 11. In this line, we can see that it's referencing letter.jpg, so let's change that to test underscore image underscore 4.png. Good, and now let's execute the code block. Awesome! Now this time we can see a nice, clear, online review from a customer about a phone purchase. In this sample image, the text is not monospaced, yet above the image we can see that OCR was still able to pull the text out without any issues whatsoever. And that's fantastic! Okay, so let's try something a little different. Let's imagine someone has taken a picture of a document and sent that in for processing. In fact, that's what I've done. The next test image is a picture that I took of this phone review. I purposefully took a picture of it on my monitor and slightly crooked. What that means is that this image is now a bit of a cross between a document scan and a real life image. So let's see if OCR can pick it up. Let's go back up to line 11 and change the image to test underscore image underscore 5.png. And let's execute the code block. Perfect! So as we can see, it's the same review as our last run, only this time the image is crooked, a bit grainy, and even a tiny bit blurry. Yet above the image, we can plainly see that the image was successfully scanned by OCR and the text extracted. Nice! So now we've seen OCR in action. We can read virtually any kind of text from virtually any kind of image. Great! When we talk about OCR, we talk about being able to extract textual data from images. 
However, we all know that some text is formulaic. Consider a business card, a receipt, or an invoice. In cases like that, the text on the image has a particular location and a particular meaning. It would be extremely useful to be able to extract information from certain documents along with their meaning. And that's where the Azure Form Recognizer service comes in. With the Form Recognizer service, you can identify key information from a particular scanned document. For example, with a receipt, you can specifically say that there's a merchant, a date, and a total amount. The Form Recognizer can then return not just the text from the image, but it can specifically tell you what that text is. The Form Recognizer service still uses OCR to extract data from forms, but it takes it a step further by organizing and categorizing the response. And some forms, like invoices, contain tables of data. Rows and columns are used to organize information on the document. While the Form Recognizer service is configurable in that custom models can be trained to identify tabular data and output appropriately formatted responses. The Form Recognizer service breaks down into three main categories. First is the Layout API. The Layout API can be used to extract layout. Specifically, the Layout API can find text, tables, selection marks, and even structure information in documents and then return the results in an organized and structured JSON response. The Layout API works with images or even PDFs. Another component of the Form Recognizer service is custom models. Custom models are used to train your own specific custom forms. If you have a particular type of document with a specific format, you can train the form recognizer to recognize it and provide a formatted response. All you need to get started is five samples so that you can train the model. After you train the model, you can start to use it to extract data from real forms. Which brings us to the last component, pre-built models. You don't have to train the form recognizer service. It actually comes with a few pre-built models that you can use against common document types. For example, this includes receipts, invoices, and business cards. So when you're using the Form Recognizer service and you want to scan forms, how do you decide which component to use? Custom models or pre-built models? Well, first there are pre-built models to consider. Pre-built models cover the most common forms cases. So that includes things like receipts, invoices, and business cards. If your form lands within a pre-built model scenario, it's much quicker and easier to use that capability. In fact, the API even has specific endpoints that you can use right out of the box to collect information from images that are based on those known types. However, sometimes you have a form that doesn't fit into one of those categories. Actually, sometimes you do, but your version is just different enough that you need your own custom model. In fact, I've worked for a few companies that seem to want to have their own version of common forms by design. So it's not uncommon. Regardless, if you can't use the pre-built models, you can create your own custom models and train the Form Recognizer service with just five samples. So just what can the Form Recognizer service identify in forms? What sorts of bits of data do we get when the service scans our forms? Well, probably the most important thing the Form Recognizer identifies is field names for values. With simple OCR, you'll get back regions that include text, and you have to decide what to do with that text. Well, with Form Recognizer, you'll get back a field that identifies the text. For example, with a receipt, you'll get back a field called Merchant Name, which includes the text that was identified to be the name of the merchant. The Form Recognizer service is also able to retrieve tables of data. So if your form has a table in it, like with invoices and receipts, the response from the service will include a breakdown of the table and the fields found in each cell. And one more thing the form recognizer returns is specific data types for found fields. It's not just text. For example, one bit of information that you can retrieve from, say, a receipt is the total cost, right? Well, with form recognizer, the total value can be returned not only as a number versus just text, but also as a currency. Form Recognizer supports the most common data types. The pre-built models for Form Recognizer are designed to retrieve known or at least expected information from forms. With pre-built models, certain information is expected to exist in the form in certain typical locations. That information is extracted and then returned in the response. To illustrate, let's take the receipt model for example. We can all envision a receipt in our heads. We know what sort of information typically exists and where on a receipt. So what does the pre-built receipt model in Form Recognizer identify and return? Well, it returns the time of the transaction, 
and not just the time, but also the date of the transaction. Now, the date and the time are separated because sometimes receipts have one or the other. Of course, the model returns the merchant information too, and this includes the name, address, identification number, and so on. And if taxes appear on the receipt, the model detects and returns that too. And what would a receipt be if it didn't include totals? So of course the model returns the totals. And remember, this will be returned as a number, not just a piece of text. And finally, any other pertinent information will also be returned. And this includes individual line items, if any, along with their quantities and prices. Now it's worth noting that it's not just these items that are returned. Just because the pre-built models are designed to return certain information, it doesn't mean that they return exclusively that information. In fact, any other text found on the document is also returned. It's just not categorized. Now, when you start using the Form Recognizer service, there are some limitations to consider. For example, only the JPEG, PNG, BMP, PDF, and TIFF formats are supported. And the size of files must be less than 20 megabytes. If images are used, then they need to be between 50 by 50 pixels and 10,000 by 10,000 pixels. If a PDF is submitted, then it can be no larger than 17 by 17 inches. In an earlier topic, we talked about the OCR API for reading text from images. Another option for reading text from images is the Read API. The Read API should be used when the image that's being scanned contains mostly text. An example of when the Read API should be used is when the image is that of a scanned or at least mostly text document. Imagine a typed letter, a memo, or even some case law. Documents have quite a bit of text on them, and the Read API is much more optimized to handle that than the OCR API. But it's not just typed text, though. The Read API is also quite good at picking up handwriting, too. So if you have a handwritten note, or even a letter, you can use the Read API to handle that, too. There are many benefits to the Read API. For example, the Read API is optimized to handle reading text from large documents. In fact, the Read API can read PDF documents of up to 2,000 pages in length. The documents must be less than 50 megabytes in size, but generally speaking, that should cover quite the bulk of documents. The Read API also uses the broker pattern. That means that processing is done asynchronously. Consumers can submit documents or images for processing, and the Read API will return a status endpoint that the consumer can use to check for responses. If you're familiar with Azure, you'll note that when you create a resource, Azure creates that resource in the background so that you can continue to perform other actions. A little status bar appears in the notification bell at the top of the screen. This is the broker pattern. When the processing is complete, the status URL returns a success or a failure response and provides the output if any was found. Another benefit of the Read API is that runs are independent. What that means is that I can submit multiple documents for processing at the same time, and each run request is given its own status endpoint because each document is processed individually and independently. Now I mentioned the broker pattern. It's worth going over that for a moment. The Read API follows that pattern when documents are submitted for processing. With the broker pattern, a consumer will submit an image or a document to the Read API and the Read API will do some quick validation of the given information to make sure that the inputs are properly provided and formatted. If all is well, the Read API will return a 202 accepted response and a status URL. The 202 code means that the API acknowledged the request and has accepted it for processing. Now this is different from a 200 OK because the actual response to the request has not been returned yet. Instead, a status URL was returned. So what is a status URL? Well, the status URL is a link back to the API so that the consumer can check on the progress of the request. While the API works on the request, it can provide updates on the progress. Now, generally, this is just things like queued, processing, and completed. So the consumer can continuously check the status URL to see the status. Obviously, you don't want to be pinging the status constantly, but a ping every couple of seconds would generally do. Then, when the processing is completed, the Read API will update the status to completed, along with an indicator as to whether or not the processing was successful or if it had failed. Once the user gets an indication that the processing is complete, the same status URL will include the results of the processing. If the results of the processing was a success, then the Read API will include all sorts of information about the document and the response. On the other hand, if the results of the processing was a failure, 
then the read API will include details of the failure so the consumer can make the necessary adjustments and try again. So just what does the read API return once it's done processing a document? Well, as you can probably imagine, there are quite a few bits of information returned when we're talking about big documents. To make things easier for the consumer, the read API response organizes the information into a few sections of the JSON response objects. Specifically, all information retrieved from the document will be returned in an object called read results. In cases where there are tables, there will be additional sections that include the information that was stored in each table. However, the bulk of the text is in the read results section. The read results section is actually an array, and each item in the array constitutes a page in the document. Each item will indicate the page number. Now it's important to note that this is a one-based index rather than a zero-based index. For each page, there's also information like language and page size. Then within each page object, there's another array called lines. Now this is the list of all the lines of text that were found on the page. Now be careful though, there's a maximum of 300 lines per page that will be returned by the API. So if you have a giant 17 by 17 inch page with lots of text, you might not get it all. The lines are sorted top to bottom and then left to right. That's important in cases where you want to read right to left text. Each line also includes a bounding box. And finally, just like there are lines within pages, there are words within lines. Each line object includes an array of word objects. The word objects are each individual word in the line along with bounding boxes and a confidence score. In this demo, we're going to use the Form Recognizer service to analyze an image of a receipt and process its content. To do that, we're going to deploy the Form Recognizer service and then use the Notebooks feature in Azure ML Studio to run some code against it and analyze an image of a receipt. Now before we can get started, we need to make sure that we have the Form Recognizer resource deployed in Azure, and then get a couple of key bits of information from there. So let's do that. First we need to head over to the Azure portal. Now to add an Azure resource, let's click on the Create a Resource link in the hamburger menu in the top left corner. Now we need to search for Form Recognizer in the search field. Now we click on the Form Recognizer box and click Create. Good. Now as always, you can select whichever subscription you want and I'm going to leave mine as the default. But now we need to select a resource group. And again, you can select to create one on the fly or you can use an existing one. And in my case, I'm going to use my existing SB test resource group. Now I'm going to leave the region as the default, and once again, you can select whichever one makes sense for you. Now let's give our resource a name. Now I'm going to call mine SB test CSFR. Now as for the pricing tier, well once again, since this is a demo, I'm going to just select to use the free option. And now I can click Review and Create. And now I can finally click Create. Good. Now our Form Recognizer resource is ready to go. But in order to use it, we'll need a couple of bits of connection information. So let's navigate to the resource and get that. We can do that by clicking on the Go To Resource button at the center of the screen. Now the Form Recognizer service is just like most Azure resources, and that means that using it requires an endpoint and a key. Now we're going to need that connection information later, so let's get it now. We can get that connection information from the Keys and Endpoint blade. Alright, so now this screen shows us two keys, an endpoint, and a location. What we need from this screen is one of the keys and the endpoint. So let's copy those values over to Notepad for use later. All right, so now we have a form recognizer resource and its connection information. Now let's actually go analyze some documents. To do that, we need to head over to our ML Studio, and I've already got mine open in another tab. So I'm just going to switch over to that tab. Good. 
Now what we want to do here is use our fancy new form recognizer service and submit some receipts to it for analysis. And if all goes well, we'll see the contents and important information from the receipt that we submit. To do that, we need to execute some code. And to do that, we need to head over to the notebook section. Now in a previous demo in this course, we downloaded Microsoft's AI Fundamentals Git repository. What we want to do here is run through one of the samples so that we can submit some receipt images to our form recognizer service for analysis. So let's expand the AI Fundamentals folder. Good. Now we can see in this folder that there are all kinds of different activities that you can do in here. In our case, we're interested in scanning receipts with the form recognizer service. So let's click on the 01F Receipts with Form Recognizer file. As always, the Microsoft sample on the Form Recognizer service actually includes a lot of useful information and guidance on how to perform this task. And it's definitely worth reading over and reviewing it for extra details. But in the interest of time, I'm going to run through this pretty quickly and then explain what's happening. So let's scroll down to the first code block. Now this code block loads a sample receipt. In fact, let's run the code block by clicking on the play button to the left of the code and see that receipt. Perfect. Now we've all seen receipts, and this one isn't that much different. It's a receipt from a fictional grocery store called North Wind Traders. It has an address, a phone number, a date, an itemized list of items purchased, and a subtotal, and a tax, and a total. All very standard stuff. And this will be the type of receipt that we'll work with in this sample. Now let's scroll down to the next code block. Now this code block is asking us for information about our deployed form recognizer service. Now in order for this notebook sample to actually connect to that service, we need to give it our connection details. So let's go ahead and copy the key to the key variable and the endpoint to the endpoint variable. And then we can run this code block by clicking on the play button to the left of the code. Excellent. Now the next thing this notebook needs is modules to be installed on the Compute instance in order to be able to run Azure's Form Recognizer service. So let's scroll down to the next code block and run the installation command. Okay, so at this point we have the entire system prepared to analyze receipts, finally. Now let's scroll down to the next code block. Now this code block executes a function called begin recognize receipts. Now this function takes an image, actually our sample image from earlier, and analyzes it for standard information. Now notice on lines 21 through 53, these lines of code are attempting to retrieve specific information from the analysis result. If the value is found, it'll be printed on the screen, otherwise it's ignored. And the information this code is collecting is the type, the address, the phone number, the date, the items including name and price, the subtotal, the tax, and the overall total. So let's run this code block and see what it tells us. Brilliant! We can see from the output that the receipt type was figured out. So were the items, the total, and so on. We can see that the total is $1.87. And if we scroll back up to the original image, we can see that the totals match. So it's worth asking the question, how is Form Recognizer different than a simple OCR? Well, the main difference is the code you just saw. OCR pulls text out and gives it back to you. The Form Recognizer service pulls text out and categorizes it. It understands the meaning of a particular value of text. In this demo, we're going to take a look at how you could train a custom model to evaluate an invoice using Form Recognizer. We'll do that by using Microsoft's online Form Recognizer service and looking through the capabilities of that service. We'll then analyze an invoice so that we can see how the service represents the data. 
Now before we begin, this demo assumes that you've run through our previous demo and have deployed an instance of the Form Recognizer service, and that you have a copy of the key and endpoint handy. If you don't, you'll need to go back and do that first. Alright, so what we want to do in this demo is take a look at how you could potentially build a custom model to analyze your own forms. To do that, we'll need to train a model with five sample forms. In order to do that training, we need to have access to a blob storage account. So let's head over to the Azure portal so that we can get the info that we need. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to cheat a little bit. What we're going to do is hijack the storage account being used by our ML Studio. Now normally you'd create your own storage account, but in the interest of time, we'll just use the existing one. So let's head over to the resource group that contains our ML Studio. For me, that's the SB Test Resource Group. Perfect, now let's click on the storage account. Good. Now what we want to do is create a new blob container that we can put our training forms into. So let's head over to the Storage Explorer by clicking on the Storage Explorer blade. Now the first thing we need to do is create a container. So let's right click on the Blob Containers section and select Create Blob Container from the context menu. Now we need a name for our container. So let's call it Form Recognizer. Now as for the access level, let's select the most open option to make things easier. Select the container option from the drop down and then click create. Good. Now let's go ahead and upload some documents that we can use to train our model. I'll provide these documents in the doobly-doo so that you can use the same ones. Now to upload the documents, click on the container that we just created, and then select Upload from the toolbar. Now we can click to browse for our files, and let's grab the training files. Let's select all of them and upload them all at once. Alright, so now we have our training files. Now we need connection details for this container. To do that, right click on our new container and select Get Shared Access Signature from the context menu. Now to make things a little easier on ourselves, we'll make our SAS key really open. Now normally you wouldn't do this because you should follow your corporate security guidelines to configure this appropriately. However, to make things a little smoother for us, we'll just keep it very open. So let's change the expiry time to one year from now, and then check off every permission, and then we'll click Create. Now perfect! In the results screen, copy the URI value into Notepad, because we're going to need that in a second. Now the tool we're going to use to train a custom model requires access to this blob storage. Now obviously that's why we grab the connection information. However, the tool calls the blob storage through that URI, and that means that cores needs to be set up, otherwise the connection will fail. So let's click on the cores blade. Now again, in the interest of ease but contrary to security guidelines, let's completely open this up by creating an entry for all access. We can do that by simply giving an asterisk in all the fields under the Blob Service tab. We'll also select all the methods and set the max age to 200. And then we'll click Save. All right. So now we're ready to get started on training a form recognition model. Now to do that, we can use Microsoft's online form recognizer UI. So let's open up another tab and browse to fott-preview.azurewebsites.net. Good. 
Now on the home screen, we're presented with three options. We can use pre-built models to get data from an image. We can use the layout feature to get text and tables from an image. Or we can create a project to train a model to get data from a custom form. In our case, we want to create our own custom model. But before we can do that, we need to establish a connection to our blob storage account. So let's first click on the connection button in the left hand toolbar. To create a connection, click on the little plus icon at the top of the connections list. Now let's give our connection a name. I'm going to call mine SBTestCon. Then at the bottom, we're asked to give the URI to our blob container. So let's copy that from Notepad. And now we can save the connection. So now we can finally get to training that custom model. So let's click on the home icon in the left hand menu. And now let's click on the train and use a model with labels option. And then select new project. And let's give our project a name. I'm going to call mine SB test proj. Then under the source connection option, let's select our connection. And finally, the form recognizer service URI and API key fields need to be filled with the connection details from our form recognizer service. So let's do that. And now let's click Save Project. Now if everything's gone right, the project will reach out to our blob storage, grab our five samples, and quickly highlight each of the text items it finds in our forms. And it looks like that's happened. So now we can get started in training our model. You'll see that the tables are automatically detected and organized into objects. We can see that by clicking on the little table icon to the left of the table discovered in the form. But what we want to do is train the model to understand what all this text is about. To do that, we need to create tags and apply them to each of the found labels. So let's click the little plus icon in the Tags toolbar in the right hand side of the screen. Now let's create a tag called Merchant underscore Name. Now let's click on the label Contoso in the form. Now that it's selected, we can apply our tag by then clicking on the tag in the right hand pane. Cool! Now let's click through all of the sample forms and apply our tag. Now let's create one more tag called charge. And now let's apply that tag to the value we see in the charges column in all of the forms. Now unlike the merchant name, the charge is a numeric value, so let's make sure the tag knows that. Click on the little downwards arrow in the charge tag that we created. Now notice that by default, it's a string type. So let's click that option to get the submenu and choose number instead. Now we'll select a subtype. Notice how below the new number menu option, there's a not specified option. So let's click on that and choose Currency instead. 
Now what you would normally do is go through each of the forms and select what labels matter to you and apply appropriate tags. However, in our case, in the interest of time, we'll leave it at this and we'll move on. What we want to do now is train the model. So let's click on the Train Model option in the left-hand menu. Now let's give our model a name. I'm going to call mine Model 1. And now let's click Train. Now this kicks off the training process, and when it's done, it provides us with details on how it feels the training went. In our case, it was really good. Now what we want to do now is use our model and see how good it is at predicting the labels that we tagged. So let's click on the Analyze icon in the left-hand menu. Now you'll see that our model has been automatically selected in the right-hand panel. If you had a different model to use, you could tap the Change button to change it. Now below the model selection, we can see options to download a Python script so that we can analyze files on our local systems. Or we can choose to upload a file to analyze. Now we're going to use the Upload feature. So let's click to upload a test file from the doobly-doo. Good, now there's our file. So let's click on the Run Analysis button and see what it comes up with. Awesome! It properly identified the merchant name and the charge. The confidence is pretty good too. Nice! Now let's do this one more time with our next test file. Excellent! Two for two. So once again, we found the merchant name and we found the charge. Regardless, you can keep training the model with more and more samples. But for now, we can see that it's working quite well. So in the end, that's custom model training. Once a model is trained, it can be composed and sent into the wild for use. Fantastic job! In this demo, we're going to use a pre-built analyzer in the Form Recognizer service to pick out fields from a receipt. To do that, we're going to use some code in the Notebooks feature of ML Studio. We'll use a sample receipt from Microsoft, run it through the analyzer, and inspect the results. Now before we begin, this demo assumes that you've run through our previous demos and have deployed an instance of the Form Recognizer service, and that you have a copy of the key and endpoint handy. If you don't, you'll need to go back and do that first. Alright, so what we want to do is run through some code that will interact with our Form Recognizer service. To do that, we need to access our ML Studio in our browser. Now since this is code that we want to run, we'll need to head over to the Notebooks section. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to use some custom code to submit a receipt to our Form Recognizer service for analysis, and then get the results from that analysis. To do that, we're first going to create a new file. So let's do that. Let's click on the Create New File button in the toolbar. Now let's give our file a name. I'm going to call mine Receipt Analysis. We'll make sure it's a notebook type and click Create. Awesome! Now before we begin, make sure you have your appropriate compute selected in the toolbar. Now we want to create a few code blocks, and I'll provide these code blocks in the doobly-doo so that you can copy them over from there. Now I'm going to copy over our first code block. Now in this code block, we're going to set our connection information from our Form Recognizer service. In fact, let's do that now. Let's copy the key to the key variable and the endpoint to the endpoint variable, and then click to run the code block. Good. Now let's create another code block by clicking on the plus icon below and to the left of our code block and selecting the code cell from the menu. What we want to do in this next code block is import an image of a receipt that we want to process. So I'm going to copy over the next code block. Now the important part of this code is on line 8 and 9. 
This is where the image location and type is defined. The location line indicates where the image can be found. In our case, the assumption is that the notebook file you created is in the same folder as the AI Fundamentals folder. In other words, they're siblings. If this isn't the case, then you may have to move your file or adjust that line of code. Anyways, let's execute this code block. Good. Now what we're seeing in the output is an image of a receipt, and that's good. Now here we can see a receipt from Northwind Traders for two piece of fruit that total $1.87. Now let's create another code block. What we want to do next is submit our image to our form recognizer service. So I'm going to copy over the next code block. In this code, our image is submitted to the form recognizer. The submission happens on line 21. The results of the submission are then placed in a variable called RESP. One of the most important parts of this code is on line 5. This line indicates that our intention is to have the form recognizer use a pre-built model called receipt. And this means that our submission will specifically be geared towards figuring out receipt contents. So let's submit this code and see what happens. Perfect! Our code executed successfully. Now the important thing to realize here is that the analysis is done asynchronously. And that means that the image is sent in for analysis and the form recognizer accepts the request with a 202 code and then gives back a URL that we can use to check if the process is complete and then get our results. And that brings us to the last code block. In our last code block, we're going to call the form recognizer service to get the results of our submission. So I'm going to paste in the last bit of code. Now in this code, we used a response from the previous code block to call the form recognizer for its results. If the work isn't done yet, a message will be displayed saying so. But if the work is done, it'll come back with the results of the analysis. So let's run the code and see what happens. Awesome! Our analysis is complete. Now the output is a bunch of JSON that's hard to read. So let's copy it over to a JSON online formatter for analysis. Great! Now what we're interested in here is the receipt specific results, if there are any. So let's collapse the read results section. Good. Now what we want to look at is the fields section in the document results section. So let's scroll down and inspect it. Perfect. All the fields are there and they're all labeled properly. In fact, we can even see the correct total of $1.87. And there you have it. We've successfully interacted with our form recognizer service to analyze a receipt and view its specific named fields. Excellent job. In this demo, we're going to use a built-in analyzer in the form recognizer service to pick out tabular data from an invoice. To do that, we're going to run some code in the notebooks feature of ML Studio. We'll use a sample invoice from Microsoft, run it through the analyzer, and inspect the results. Now before we begin, this demo assumes that you've run through our previous demos and have deployed an instance of the form recognizer service, and that you have a copy of the key and endpoint handy. If you don't, you'll need to go back and do that first. Alright, so what we want to do is run through some code that will interact with our form recognizer service. To do that, we need to access our ML Studio instance in our browser. Now since this is code that we want to run, we'll need to head over to the Notebook section. Now in this demo, we're going to analyze a table in an invoice. So what we want to do is first upload a sample invoice. I'll provide that sample in the doobly-doo for you. To make things a little easier, let's upload the sample invoice to the same location as the sample receipt that we used in our previous demo. So let's expand the AI Fundamentals folder. Then expand the data folder. And now let's click on the ellipsis button to the right of the form receipt folder. And choose the upload files option. 
Now I'll grab the sample invoice and upload it. Now this automatically opens the invoice in a new tab, and that's good because then we can take a quick peek at it. Now notice that there are two tables. The first is a list of purchase orders, and the second is the actual purchased items. So it might be a bit difficult to see, but let's remember that in row 2, column 2 of the second table, we have a value of consulting service, and we'll verify that in our output later. All right, now what we want to do here is we're going to use some custom code to submit that invoice to our form recognizer service for analysis, and then get the results from that analysis. To do that, we're first going to create a new file. So let's do that. Let's click on the Create New File button in the toolbar. Now let's give our file a name. I'm going to call mine Invoice Analysis. We'll make sure Notebook is the type, and we'll click Create. Awesome. Now before we begin, make sure you have your appropriate compute selected in the toolbar. Good. Now we're going to create a few code blocks, and I'll provide those code blocks in the doobly-doo so that you can copy them from over there. Now I'm going to copy over our first code block. In this code block, we're going to set our connection information from our form recognizer service. In fact, let's do that now. Let's copy in the key to the key variable and the endpoint to the endpoint variable, and then click to run the code block. Good. Now let's create another code block by clicking on the plus icon below and to the left of our code block and selecting Code Cell from the menu. Now what we want to do in this next code block is import our image of the invoice that we want to process. So I'm going to copy over that next code block. Now the important part of this code is on line 8 and 9. And this is where the image location and type is defined. The location line indicates where the image can be found. And in our case, the assumption is that the notebook file you created is in the same folder as the AI Fundamentals folder. In other words, they're siblings. If that's not the case, then you may have to move your file or adjust that line of code. Anyways, let's execute this code block. Good. Now what we're seeing in the output is an image of our invoice that we uploaded earlier, and never mind the yellow background. This is a good sign. Now let's create another code block. What we want to do next is submit our image to our form recognizer service. So now I'm going to copy over the next code block. Now in this code, our image is submitted to the form recognizer. The submission actually happens on line 21. The results of the submission are then placed into a variable called RESP. Now one of the most important parts of this code is on line 5. This line indicates our intention is to have the form recognizer use the pre-built model called invoice, and this means that our submission will be specifically geared towards figuring out invoice contents. So let's submit this code and see what happens. Perfect. Our code executed successfully. Now the important thing to realize here is that the analysis is being done asynchronously, and that means that the image is sent in for analysis and the form recognizer accepts that request with a 202 code and then gives back a URL that we can use to check if the process is complete and then get our results. And that brings us to the last code block. Let's create it now. What we're gonna do in this code block is we're going to call the form recognizer service and get the results of our submission. So I'm going to paste in the last little bit of code. Now in this code, we use the response from the previous code block to call the form recognizer service for its results. If the work isn't done yet, a message will be displayed saying so. But if the work is done, it'll come back with the results of the analysis. So let's run the code and see what happens. Awesome! Our analysis is complete, and the output is a bunch of really hideous JSON that's hard to read. So let's copy it over to a JSON online formatter for analysis.
Great. Now what we're interested in here is the invoice specific results if there are any. So let's collapse the read results section. This section has all the raw labels in it anyways. Good. Now what we want to look at is the tables section in the page results section. So let's scroll down and inspect it. Perfect. Notice how all the cells are individually shown. Each cell indicates which row and column it was found in. All the fields are there and they're all labeled properly. In fact, we can even see that in row index 1, which means the second row, and column index 1, which means the second column, we found the text consulting service. Super cool! And there you have it. We've successfully interacted with our form recognizer service to analyze an invoice and pick out table contents. Excellent job! So in this course, we've used facial recognition to analyze faces and optical character recognition to analyze forms and receipts. We did this by exploring using the computer vision services to analyze a face to determine age, using video indexer to identify faces and videos, using the face service to detect, recognize, and analyze faces for sentiment, using the Azure Optical Character Recognition, or OCR API, using the computer vision service to read text, text from photographs, and digitized documents, using the form recognizer service and the read API, using the pre-built receipt and custom form recognizer model, and processing tables on forms.